Good morning everyone. We are the group 4 and we will discuss about structural geology. In your screen, I am Queenie Jean Dirichoso and I will talk about the subtopics of the structural geology which is attitude of beds and outcrops. Structural geology, attitude of beds and outcrops. First, what is structural geology? It is a subdiscipline of geology that studies how rocks deform in response to the stresses that act within the earth. These are the examples of structural geology. Now we will move to the subtopics of the structural geology which is attitude of beds. Attitude of beds is called bedding attitude. It is defined as the strike and dip of a bed. Geologists often measure the strike and dip of a surface using a Bronton compass. Attitude is the orientation of a rock unit or surface. Strike the compass bearing or direction of a line formed by the intersection of a horizontal plane and an inclined layer or bed stratum of rock, fold, or fracture. Example of strike. You can see the horizontal line on the dripping surface. That, that is what we call strike. Deep. The angle between a horizontal plane and the inclined or tilted stratum fault or fracture. Example of deep. You can see in the picture, the example picture that there, there is an angle and that angle is called deep. Outcrop. The exposed rock, also known as crops out. When weathering and erosion expose part of a rock layer or formation, an outcrop appears. Example of outcrop caused by weathering and erosion. Outcrop patterns. A geologic maps that show where various rock units and structures lies at the Earth's surface. Many of these structures are called planar. Example of outcrop patterns. Now, what is planar? Planar. It is called flatline beds, where beds are horizontal or nearly horizontal their contacts must also be horizontal. Example of planar. It allow direct observation and something of the bedrock that is used for geologic analysis. Two kinds of outcrops. Number one, caused by human activity, and number two, is natural outcrop formed as the consequences of river and sea erosion. That's all and thank you. Now we will move to the next reporter of our group. Hi, I am Jason Angelata, and I'm about to report geologic maps. So, who invented the geologic map? It was William Smith, the one who credited with creating the first useful geologic map. However, like many other accomplishment, great accomplishment, also Smith's ideas of depicting the distribution of rocks on a top topographic map didn't materialize out of nowhere. As you can see in your screen, this was the first geologic map. John Ettingala and Philip map showing the distribution of chalk around the Paris Basin extending across the English Channel into Southern Britain in the year of 1746. However, it was still a important milestone. 
This map summarizes in a single image a large amount of geologic information about the region. As a matter of historical significance, it shows for the first time the distribution of a single unit across space. This map is an important milestone, but it's not what the most geologists will instantly recognize as a geologic map, because it emphasizes just one unit, excluding all others, and because it uses only one color, and as you can see, it's only black and white. Okay, so as you can see the difference, William Smith's geologic map are colorful that makes geologists find things easier, and that's why it is the major milestone in geologic mapping. So, what is geologic maps? Geologic maps are uniquely suited in solving problems involving earth resources, hazards, and environments. Maps are essential tools for geology. Hindi siya lugaw, pero essential siya. Charot. Maps are as important in geology as written text in the study of literature. By studying maps, a geologist can see the shape and geology of the Earth's surface, and deduce the geological structures that lie hidden beneath the surface. The value of geologic map, geologic map information in public and private decision making, such as setting of landfills and highways, has repeatedly been described anecdotally and been, has been dis demonstrated in benefit cost analysis to reduce uncertainty and by extension potential costs. These are the other types of maps. A topographic map. It shows three dimensional shape of the land and features on the surface of the earth. A topographic map is one type of map. Topographic maps are important in geology because they portray the surface of the earth in detail. These maps are also used by hikers, planners who make decisions on zoning and construction permits, government agencies involved in land, using planning and hazard assessments, and of course, civil engineers. Bathymetric map. A bathymetric map is like a topographic map, with the contour lines representing depth below sea level rather than height above. Numbers are low near sea level and become higher with depth. Study of structures geologic map. Geologic structures such as anticlines, synclines, domes, basins, and faults are not always easily visible. By mapping the slopes, orientations, and types of rocks in an area, geologists can create a geologic map and geologic cross-section to learn about the structures. Strike and dip Strike and dip are often easier to see an exposure of rock than on a map. Geologists use strike and dip symbols on geologic maps to show strike and dips measured in the feet. Cross-sections Geologic cross-sections are representations of underground geology. Geologists use geologic maps with structural symbols, like the map of solemn area to create cross-sections. The line on the map is the line along which the cross-section was drawn. Anticlines, synclines, and faults can be seen in cross-sections. That's all, thank you. Geologic structures are formed from large forces that can be compression, tension, and shear, such as the stress of tectonic plates and stress of gravity. Rocks under these kinds of forces may develop rock deformations and failures. And today, I am going to discuss the three of these geologic structures, which are the folds, faults, and joints. Folds occur when a rock strata face high compression stress. The originally flat and planar surface of the sedimentary rock layer become bent or curved, which may be, may be viewed as plastic deformation rock strata and may result to permanent change of the rock's shape. Folding may result to anticlines, which are arc-like shape folds, Sink lines, which are folds with younger layers closer to the center of the structure, and monoclines, which are folds consisting of two horizontal limbs connected by a shorter inclined limb. Moving on to the fourth classification of folds, symmetrical folds is the one in which the actual plane is vertical. When the actual plane is inclined, it is called an asymmetrical fold. Overturned fold is when the beds dip in the same direction on both sides of the actual plane, 
and recumbent fold is an example of an overturned fold to where the actual plane is horizontal. Now let's proceed to faults. This geologic structure is a fracture between two blocks of rocks as the Earth's response to stress or from the movement of tectonic plates which breaks the rocks in the surface. Faults are considered to be the most undesirable geologic structure due to its association with many hazards such as strong ground shaking in a wide range of area that may cause um, structural damages. There are four types of faulting. These are the normal fault which is a deep slip fault where in the block above the fault move downward relative to the block below the fault. The reverse fault is the opposite of the normal fault. It occurs when a hanging wall rises relative to the foot wall. Strike slip fault occurs when two blocks slide past one another moving predominantly horizontal and the last type is an oblique fault which has the component of, of both deep slip and strike slip faults. Now let's proceed to joints. These occur when the fractures in the surface of the rock has little to no displacement from the origin of the body. And joints are among the universal geologic structures as it is found in almost every rock exposure. Now let's compare faults and joints. They are both fractures or discontinuities, however, joints are smaller than faults. Joints have little to no displacement while faults move lateral that cause displacement. Joints are formed by rock stress while faults are formed by tectonic movements. And joints rarely cause hazards while faults cause deadly and destructive forces. Now let's proceed to the types of joints in terms of geometry. Non-systematic joints are irregular in form, spacing, and orientation. Systematic joints are planar parallel joints and columnar joints are distinctive types of joints which are which join together in triple junctions either at or about 120 degrees so these are the types of joints with respect to its formation tectonic joints are formed when the relative displacement of the joint walls are normal to its plane hydraulic joints are formed as a result of vertical gravitational loading or fluid pores become elevated. Exfoliation joints are surface parallel fracture systems in rocks and they resemble layers of an onion. Loading joints are formed near the surface when the rocks are exposed to erosion. And cooling joints are columnar joints formed from cooling of either lava or flood basalt flow. Geologic structures such as folds, faults, and joints are very important in the point of view of civil engineering constructions, particularly in the location of dams, reservoirs, tunneling, quarrying, roads, railways, and other infrastructures. Due to tectonic forces, rocks get deformed that results to occurrences of great strain in rocks. In civil engineering construction, these folds may cause say in tunneling, bulging, and caving. Thus, the physical effects produced in rocks due to folding is a very important consideration in civil engineering construction point of view. Faults cause fracturing and shattering of rocks along the fault line, making the place unfit for construction sites. Places along fault lines are not considered to be compact or strong enough to withstand um, heavy loads such as dams. Faults are also generally accompanied by earthquakes that cause severe shaking of the ground that may lead to collapse of engineering constructions. Therefore, careful study of the tectonic history should be followed such as grouting or plugging the fault zone with concrete to make it fit to hold heavy engineering construction sites. Joints can be effective planes of leakage of water. However, sites with joints are weak and through these joints, water percolate and saturate the rocks that may further lead to the decay of rocks and cause to reduce the strength of the rocks, making the site unsuitable for construction of heavy loads such as tunnels. That 
ends my discussion in folds, faults, and joints and their bearing in engineering construction. Thank you. So, pag-usapan naman natin ngayon ang rock mechanics. Pero bago yan, ipakilala ko muna yung ang sarili ko. I am Melissa Dalaman din from BSCE 2A. So, maraming nalilito uh, nalilito sa rock mechanics. Minsan, napapagkamala na ang rock engineering ay ang rock mechanics ay magkapareho. Pero, may pagkakapareho sila, pero hindi Hindi lahat. Ang um, rock mechanics involves characterizing the intact strength and the geometry and the mechanical properties of the natural fractures of the rock mass while the rock engineering is concerned with specific engineering circumstances. Rock engineering is the discipline of designing and supporting stable excavation in rock. By understanding the properties of the rock, quantities as well as one qualitatively the design of stable excavations in mines is made possible. In addition, the rock engineering entails an understanding of available supports, support style and their performance. This is used to select the optimum support required for the stability of excavations, considering relevant factors such as safety, length of service, and economics. Rock engineering also includes a working understanding in mining induced seismicity including mechanisms, mine layouts to minimize seismicity support to minimize rock burst damage. So, nature of rock. Ang um, mechanical behavior ng solids ay madalas na Napapagkamala ang kapareho ng mechanical behavior of rocks. Although, rocks are solids, but they but then, mechanical behavior are different. So, solid mechanical behavior are homogeneous, continuous, and isotropic. Homogeneous, which means consisting of parts or elements that are all the same. Continuous, continuing without stopping. And isotropic, which means having identical values of a property in all directions. However, rock's mechanical properties are more complex, such as heterogeneous, discontinuous, and anisotropic. So, heterogeneous means denoting a process in involving substance in different phases, such as liquid, solids, or gaseous, discontinuous, which means having intervals or gaps, and anisotropics direction dependent index properties of intact rocks so intact rock refers to the unfractured blocks between discontinuities in a typical rock mass index properties of intact rocks includes specific gravity of solids unit weight porosity which means the ratio expresses a percentage of a volume of the pores or interstices interstices of a substance as a rock or rock stratum. Ultrasonic velocity, calculated as were frequency of the ultrasonic waves and the, measure, the measured wavelength value of the ultrasonic waves in a given solution. Compressive, compressive strength, which means the resistance of a material to break under compression, tensile strength, the resistance of a material to break under tension, elastic modulus, which means a quantity that requires an object or substance resistance to being deformed elastically. Intact rock classifications are rock type, geologic formation, and age. Rock as a construction material. So, rock is very important to construction because it is very helpful in laying structural foundations to support structure, for constructing underground openings, for protecting slope, and for supporting railways, railway tracks as sub-base or base for roads and runways, and as aggregates in concrete, and lastly, making fascia for buildings.
So, rocks are having so much physical and mechanical properties. This includes the unit weight, specific gravity of solids, void ratio. It is the ratio of a uh, incomplete or empty porosity. The ratio is expressed as a percentage of volume of the pores. And density, the degree of compactness of a substance, moisture, or water constant, or moisture content is the quantity of water contained in a material. Permeability is the quality or state of being permeable or able to be penetrated or passed through, especially by a liquid or gas. Stress is a physical quantity that expresses the internal force that neighboring particles of a continuous material exert on each other. Strain measured of the deformation of a material. Deformability is the degree to which applying a force can make a particle or solid change shape. Hardness is the quality or condition of being hard. Talking about structural geology includes porosity and permeability. Porosity refers to the amount of empty space within a given material. In a soil or rock, the porosity or empty space exists between the grains of material. In a material like gravel, the grains are large and there is lots of empty space between them since they don't fit together very well. However, in a material like gravel, sand, and clay mixture, the porosity is much less as the smaller grains fill the spaces. The amount of water a material can hold is directly related to the porosity since water will try and fill the empty spaces in the material. We measure porosity by percentage of empty space that exists within a particular porous medium. In short, Porosity is a measure of the empty spaces in the material. We calculate porosity through this formula. Fluid over the amount of material multiplied to 100. On the other hand, permeability is closely related to porosity. It refers to how connected pore spaces are to one another. If the material has high permeability, then pore spaces are connected to one another, allowing water to flow from one another. However, if there is low permeability, then pore spaces are isolated and water is trapped within them. For example, in a gravel, all the pores will connect to one another, allowing water flow through it. However, in a clay, most of the pore spaces are black, meaning water cannot flow through it easily. In short, permeability is the ability of liquid and gas to pass through materials.
Hello everyone, I am Ednaline and today I am going to discuss to you the density and strength of rocks. So first, let me begin in giving you a brief description about density. Um, density is defined as the mass of a substance per unit volume. But in some cases, density is often determined using weight rather than mass. And to differentiate the weight from mass, weight is the force that gravitation exerts on a body and varies with location. While mass, on the other hand, is the measure of the matter in a body that is constant regardless with the location. And lastly, um, density is reported in kilogram per cubic meter but sometimes given in a grams per cubic centimeter. Now we move on to the density of rocks. Um, density of rocks varies in different rock types and it is because of the differences in mineralogy and porosity. So since I've mentioned that there are different types of rocks, now I am only focusing on two which is the ordinary rocks and the plastic sedimentary rocks. Um, now to calculate the density of these ordinary rocks, we have here phi sub b represented the, um, the density equals w sub g over v sub b wherein w sub g um, represents the weight of grains known as the sedimentary rocks or it can be crystals known as the igneous and metamorphic rocks and if there are any w sub g could represent the natural cements while v sub b is equal to the total volume of the grains or crystals plus the core or void space the density of these ordinary rocks can be dry if the pore space is empty or it can also be saturated if the pore space is filled with fluid or example the water but to calculate the saturated density we now have the P sub B equals to W sub G plus W sub FL which is the weight of pore fluid all over V sub B. To measure the density of a given specimen, we need to have at least two quantities of it. It could be either the pore volume, the grain volume, or the, the bulk volume along with the weight. Next is to assess the different types of racks we could make use of the histogram plot um, representing the mean which is the average volume, um, the mode which is the common volume, the median which is the middle set or, or the sample data, and last is the standard deviation. Now we go to the second type of rocks which is the plastic sedimentary rocks and the density for this kind of rocks increases as the rocks are progressively buried. And the reason for that is the increase in the overburden pressure that causes compaction and cementation. While the overburden pressure increases, the porosity of compaction and cementation decreases. The bulk densities of a sedimentary rock that have usually the variable porosity are given both dry density and saturated density. So for the last topic, I have here four additional information and those are the pore filling fluid that is usually bringing water because of the presence of the seawater when the rock was being deposited or lithified. And it also be noted that the bulk density is lesser than the grain density depending on the porosity. So we have here the situation if the um, if the porosity is zero, then bulk density would be equal to grain density. And last, the saturated bulk density is higher than the dry bulk density because of the added presence of the, um, of the pore filling fluid. And now we are done with the first topic. Now we go to the second topic which is about strength. In physics, strength is the ability to withstand an apply load without any failure or plastic deformation. And there are also two types of strength. The first one is the compressive strength and the second one is the tensile strength. For compressive strength, compressive strength is defined 
as the capacity of an object to withstand and apply load tending to reduce sizes. And strength in plastic material is defined as the level of the stress at failure. And the brittle rock is at the failure because of the rock loses all resistance to stress and crumbles. And in plastic materials, the point of failure is difficult to identify because of its deformation that continues at a constant level of stress. On the other hand, tensile strength is the capacity of an object to withstand an apply load tending to elongate or it also defined as the resistance to failure under tensile stress. And lastly, tensile strength is much lower than compressive strength. Good day everyone, I am Jo and Dokot. And now let's move on to my topic which is hardness and elasticity as part of the properties of the rocks. What is hardness? Hardness is the ability of a material to resist deformation. Hardness is one of the most investigated properties of materials, yet it is one of the most complex to understand. It does not lend itself to exact definition in terms of physical concepts. The numerical value of hardness is as much a function of the type of test used as a material property. So hardness is also the subjective description of the resistance of an earth material, the permanent deformation, particularly by impact or scratching. Rock hardness is not the same as mineral hardness. So hardness, hardness categories provide reasonable estimates of rock material strength. For classifying earth material as rock is excavated auxiliary spillways. So the, the designer must carefully consider the characteristics of the rock mass before reaching a decision on alignment and location of a rock spillway. So next is elasticity. Elasticity is a measure of variable sensitivity to a change in another variable. In elastic deformation, there are various constants that relate the magnitude of the strain response to the applied stress. So rocks are subjective to stresses. Mostly, it is related to plate tectonics or earthquakes and also to the weight of overlying rocks and their response to that stresses is the strain or the deformation. In regions close to where plates are converging, stress is typically compressive to where the rocks are being squeezed. Where plates are diverging, the stress is extensive rocks are being pulled apart and at transform plate boundaries where plates are moving side by side there is sideways or shear stress meaning that there is there are forces in opposite directions parallel to a plane rock can respond to stress in three ways first it can deform elastically second it can deform plastically and the third, it can break or fractured. Elastic strain is reversible. If the stress is removed, the rock will return to its original shape, just like a rubber band that is stretched and released. Plastic strain is not reversible. As already noted, different rocks at different temperatures will behave in different ways to stress meaning higher temperatures lead to more plastic behavior. Some rocks or sediments are also more plastic when they are wet. Another factor is the rate at which the stress is applied. If the stress is applied quickly, so for example, because of an extraterrestrial impact or an earthquake, there will be an increased tendency for the rock to fracture. So, as you can see in the figure, this is the varying types of response of geological materials to stress. As you can see, the, X, the straight dashed parts are elastic 
are elastic strain and the curved parts are plastic strain. In each case, the X marks were the material fractures. So let's see A, the strongest material, is the strongest material. Deforms relatively little and breaks at the highest stress level or curved at the highest point. And B, it is strong but brittle, shows no plastic deformation and breaks after relatively little elastic deformation. And the C, the most deformable, it is it breaks only after significant elastic and plastic strain. So as you can see at the right side, it is the the tree deformation diagram shows that A and C before breaking and B after breaking. So the outcomes of placing rock under stress are highly are highly variable, but they include fracturing, tilting and folding, stretching and squeezing and folding. A fracture is a simple break that does not involve significant movement of the rock on either side. Fracturing is particularly common in volcanic rock, which shrinks as it cools. When a body of rock is compressed in one direction, it is typically extended or stretched in another. This is an important concept because some geological structures only form under compression while others only form under tension. So a fault is a rock boundary along which the rocks on either side have been displaced relative to each other. So that's all with my topic. Thank you. Plasticity. Plasticity is ang um, kabaliktaran ng elasticity. Um, plasticity ay nag-undergo nag if ang um, material ay nag-undergo sa inelastic strain or permanent deformation beyond elastic limit. So, ang meaning ng plasticity ay kapag ang material nag-undergo ng plastic deformation, then hindi na ito babalik sa original nitong dimension or ang shape nito kahit natanggalin ang applied loads. Let us talk about the dynamic properties of rocks. So, dynamic properties of rocks consist of four which are wave theory, different factors that affect wave velocity, statistic and dynamic moduli, elasticity and grouting. I will, hindi ko na ipapaliwanag ang mga ito dahil ipapaliwanag ito ng mga next supporter. Hello, so my name is Jan Haru Giluana and I'm here to discuss types of wave theory. There are, types, there are two types of wave theories that I have found, and the first one is seismic waves. There are several different kinds of seismic waves, and they all move in different waves. Two main types of waves are body waves and surface waves. Body waves can travel through the Earth's inner layers, but surface waves can only move along the surface of the planet, like ripples on water. Earthquakes radiate seismic energy as both body and surface waves. There are two types of seismic waves. First is the body waves. Body waves travel through the interior of the earth. Body waves arise before the surface waves emitted by an earthquake. These waves are of a higher frequency than surface waves. There are two types of body waves. The first type is the P waves. The first kind of body wave is the P waves, or the primary wave. This is the fastest kind of seismic wave, and consequently the first to arrive at the seismic station. The P wave can move through solid rock and fluids like water or the liquid layers of the earth. It pushes and pulls the rock, and it moves through just like sound waves push and pull the air. P waves are also known as a compressional wave. Because of the pushing and pulling, they do subjected to a P wave. Particles move in the same direction that the wave is moving, which is the direction that the energy is traveling in, and is sometimes called the direction of wave property. The other type is the S waves, or secondary waves, which is the second wave you feel 
in an earthquake, like an aftershock. An ice wave is lower than a P wave and can only move through solid rocks, not through any liquid medium. It is the property of S waves that this is small used to conclude that the Earth's outer core is a liquid. S waves move rock particles up and down or side to side, so perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling in. The other type of waves is the surface waves. Traveling only through the crust, surface waves are of a lower frequency than body waves and are easily distinguished on a seismogram as a result. Though they arrive after a body waves arrives, it is surface waves that are almost entirely responsible for the damage and destruction associated with the earthquakes. This damage and the strength of the surface waves are reduced in deeper earthquakes. There are two types of surface waves, and the first is love waves. Named after E. H. Love, a British mathematician who worked out the mathem mathematical model for this kind of wave in 1911. It's the fastest surface wave and moves the ground from side to side. Confined to the surface of the crust, love waves produce entirely horizontal motion. The other wave is the rider waves. It is named after John William Strutt, Lord Willie, who mathematically predicted the existence of this kind of wave in 1885. A Rayleigh wave rolls along the ground just like a wave of rolls across a lake or an ocean. Because it rolls, it moves the ground up and down and side to side, in the same direction that the wave is moving. Most of the shaking felt from an earthquake is due to the Rayleigh wave, which can be much larger than the other waves. The other topic that I will discuss is the factors influencing wave velocity. The velocity of a wave depends upon the material or medium in which it is traveling. Typically, the stronger the coupling between the atoms or molecules that make up the medium and the less massive they are, the faster the wave will travel. So all waves of the same type travel at the same speed. For example, a sound wave in the air at 0 degrees Celsius will travel at 31 meters per second, regardless of the sun's frequency or amplitude. Electromagnetic waves can travel either through empty space or through materials. Their velocity depends on the electric and magnetic properties of space or the materials, but not on frequency or amplitude. The velocity of water waves depend both on the properties of the water and on the frequency of the wave. The wavelength and speed of a wave can be influenced by many factors. Um, I haven't included any factors because in the past um, impulse, you can already see what um, influence the velocity of the wave. Adjust and plan amplitude, frequency, tension, and density as described in the table. So that's all. Thank you. Good day, guys. So my name is Riconel S. Espena, and my report is all about static and dynamic moduli of elasticity and grouting. So first, let's discuss about static and dynamic moduli of elasticity. What is static modulus of elasticity? It is a stress curve drawn with the help of values of stress and strain, of, strain obtained. It has been observed that even under short-term loading, concrete does not behave as an elastic materials. The value of modulus of elasticity is E base to C determined by actual loading of, of, of a concrete. This method of, of testing is known as destructive method as the specimen is stressed or loaded till its failure. The static modulus of elasticity does not represent the true elastic behavior of the concrete due to the phenomenon of creep. At higher stress, the modulus of elasticity is affected more seriously. The strain obtained at, as above are plotted against stress and curve is obtained shown in figure 15.5. As concrete in an imperfect elastic material, Stress-strain diagram is a curved line. Hence, three methods can be used to determine the modulus of elasticity. First is initial tangent modulus, tangent modulus, and the second modulus. Initial tangent modulus 
is represented by the slope of a tangent to the stress strain curve drawn passing through the origin. This modulus has significance only for low stresses and thus is of limited value and not easy to determine. In this figure, the initial tangent is this line O to A. Next is tangent modulus. It is represented by the slope of the line drawn tangent to the stress strain curve at any point on the curve. But this modulus applies only to very small changes in load above or below the load at which the tangent modulus is considered. Secondly, it is, a, is, it is difficult to determine tangent modulus with accuracy as the tangent to the curve is drawn by the eye judgment. So this line is the tangent modulus. Last is the second modulus. It is thus represented by the slope of a line drawn from the origin to any point C on the curve. This method is most practical and is most general use as it represents the actual deformation at the selected point and no uncertainties are involved in its determination. Second modulus is found to decrease with the increase in stress, hence stress at which it has been determined should be stated. So in this figure, this line is the second modulus, O to C. Next is dynamics modulus of elasticity. If the static modulus of elasticity is destructive method, this dynamics this dynamic modulus of elasticity is non-destructive because it's it adapted for determining the modulus of elasticity. In this case, no stress is applied on the specimen. The modulus of elasticity is determined by subjecting the specimen longitudinal vibration at their natural frequency. That is why this is known as dynamic modulus. In this method, either the resonant frequency through a specimen of concrete or pulse velocity traveling through the concrete is measured. From known values of the length of specimen, density of concrete and resonant frequency, the value of dynamic modulus is SI units, is determined from the relation of this formula, where ED is the dynamic modulus, K is for constant, N is for resonant frequency, L is for length of specimen, and P is for density of concrete. If the length of specimen is measured in millimeter and density of P in kilogram per M3, then, if, then this is the formula. The value of dynamic modulus of elastic, elasticity can be determined from relation of this formula where the V is full velocity in millimeter per second, P is de density of concrete kilogram per M3 and this Poisson's ratio. The value of mod dynamic modulus of elasticity computed from ultrasonic pulse velocity method is somewhat higher than static modulus of elasticity as the creep remains unaffected in dynamic modulus. Creep also does not significantly affect the initial tangent modulus. Thus, the value of the initial tangent modulus and dynamic modulus is approximately the same. But, the value of dynamic modulus is appreciably higher than second modulus. The relation between static and dynamic modul modulic is given by the following relation in Gn over M2. The relation between modulus of elasticity and strength. It has been observed that for the sum strength, stress strength ratio, the stronger the concrete, the higher the strain. On the, on the contrary, stronger the concrete, higher the modulus of elasticity. This may be due to the fact that the stronger concrete, its gel is also stronger. Hence, there is less strain for a given load. This lower strain gives the higher values of modulus of elasticity. Next topic is grouting. Grouting is 
as process of injecting material into cavities of rocks in concrete. Masonry in structure, soil, rock mass to increase the structure load. Structure load bearing capacity refers to gravity. It is also a packable material that can be used to fill the space between two elements of ba for bonding them or to create water, watertight seal. Application, application for grouting Increase the strength and bearing capacity of soil stability. Reduce leakage and control and, uh, groundwater during construction. Form groundwater barriers and rehabilitate or reinforce structures. Types of grounding Cement grounding Is the injection under pressure of cement of ground to fill voids or fracture in the soil. Rock unit of concrete surface structure. Cement grouting process by which cement is injected under pressure to fill fractures and weeds in concrete structures. Chemical grouting. Transform granular soils into sandstone-like masses by filling the void with a low viscosity non-particulate grout. It is injected under pressure through the ports. <coughs> Bentonite grouting. It's a specially formulated sodium bentonite. It is. It can be used for drilled hold abandonment, water well grout, sealing monitoring well carrying, or as a geothermal grout. Resin grouting is a, is a traditional grout that is made from a cement-based mix. It's not waterproof and actually absorbs water when it becomes wet. It also absorbs stains easily as anyone who has. And the last is bituminous grouting. It is a special type of grouting where melting bitu bitumen is used as grouting material. When, not be when hot bitumen is injected into med medium saturated with water, it cools quickly at the interface and turns from fluid state highly bi viscous. The naturally sticky and elastoplastic state. It's like the spalto. Methods of grouting. Permission grouting or penetration. It is a ground treatment method in which grout is injected into a porous medium without disturbing its original structure. It is usually referred to the process of peeling the pot pores and joints in a soil and rock deposits, deposit to change its geotechnical properties. Next is compaction grouting. It involves encryption of a thick cons consistency soil cement grout under pressure into a soil mass, consolidating and thereby densifying surrounding soil in, in place. When grouting treatment is applied on a grid pattern, the, the result is improved compaction of displaced soils and greater uniformity of treated soil mass. As a secondary benefit, the result of grout columns adds strength in the vertical axis at is typically grout compressive strength exceed those of the surrounding soils. So this picture is the example of on how the compaction grouting process. Displacement grouting. This method is suitable for all types of loose coarse gained soil, soft drained soils, which are not saturated for filling underground cavities. It is also not used for soft saturated fine grained soils because grouting raises the pore water pressure in the soil mass leading to uneven and aggravated settlement problems. Next is the jet or replacement displacement grouting. In this technique, a, a special grout pipe called the monitor or having high speed feeds of water or grout is used to erode and excavate the soil. Thereafter, the monitor is withdrawn, strong impervious columns are produced by mixing grout with the remaining soil. It is more expensive than permission grouting. It is the youngest of grouting techniques. So this is the example of how the grouting 
methods is done. Grounding characteristics. Droughtability. Droughtability is to obtain satisfactory performance. Grain size distribution should be shown because it shall show the relationship between the grout particle size and the void dimension. Stability. Capability of grout to remain in a fluid state and not aggregate into separated components. Setting time. Early setting time causes difficulty in the grout reaching its destination. While late setting causes the grout being washed away if seepage is occurring through soil. So it should be on time. Permanence. Resistance to grout possesses against being displaced from the soil voids with time. And last, the toxic toxicity. Capacity of grouts to contaminate the grout water. The advantage of grouting. This can be done on almost any ground condition. It does not induce vibration and can be controlled to avoid structural damage. Improvement in ground structure can be measured. Very useful for limited space and low headroom application. Used for slabs, jacking, and loose or levels that deform foundation. And it can be installed adjacent to existing walls. And can be used to control seepage, groundwater floor, and hazardous water materials. Process and its time. So that's all. Thank you.